it's Patrick Cristiano, the publisher of TheaterLife.com uh, for Spotlight on the Arts, and I'm with Robert Horn, the book writer for the hit musical Tootsie. He's just been nominated for a Tony Award. He's won the Drama Desk and the Outer Critics Circle. Uh, he's crazy. Gonna, yeah, we'll find out if he gets the trifecta on Sunday. Yeah, Robert. Thank you so much for coming My to do pleasure. this. My really, pleasure. Uh, you have been so wonderful to me. I see Patrick at all the different press uh, events, and you're always so nice and so supportive and so wonderful, and I appreciate it because I'm nervous. Well, <laughs> I get nervous. <laughs> not, not for this, are you? <laughs> no, now I feel like I know you. Oh, okay, good. Because, you know, I didn't know anything about you except for you wrote this funny, funny book for this but this, you know, this movie that I was one of my favorite yeah. movies that I've ever seen that I still remember and delved on me, and you brought it up to modern times. They brought it to 2019, and you took it from yeah. a television to the theater. Whose idea was that? Well, the uh, oh, the uh, to take it from the soap opera to the yeah, yeah. Uh, that was sort of a collective. We were, you know, uh, we knew that. Uh, soap operas were just not relevant now. There's, there were so many. There were elements to the movie we had to really pinpoint that say what worked in 1982 that doesn't work now. And obviously that was one of the big ones. And also, nobody wants to see a bunch of fake cameras rolling around on a Broadway stage and sort of be in that world. And the question you always have to ask yourself is why does a musical sing? When you're writing a musical, there sort of has to be in its in its. Uh, DNA, there has to be a reason for it to, to be a musical. And so moving it to the um, stage just felt, it just was a very organic idea. I actually, when I went in to meet with David Yazbek on our very first meeting, I had got, because, of, well, I'll tell you a little of the story, but when I got the call to go in really to meet on it, to get that kind of no, I said no. You I said, said no. I don't want to take the meeting. I didn't want to take the meeting. You didn't want why? Um, why, that's a good question. Because, for a number of reasons, I, you know, I've been, this is my fifth musical, but I haven't had a, a big, a big hit. 13 was somewhat successful, but it wasn't. And I, and I um, didn't want to have that big target on my back because I knew there was a, a big potential that you couldn't succeed in doing this. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's very intimidating. And I was like, maybe that shouldn't be my, my next project. Oh, wow. um, and, and I also felt I'm such a big fan of Larry Gelbart. You know, Larry Gelbart was, he's iconic. He's from that Larry Gelbart, Neil Simon, uh, Mel Brooks school of, of writing and comedy. And I sort of, you, they were my mentors. That's who I, I aspire to be like. And I felt like I couldn't put my um, name on his work. So when I, I took the meeting, I sa when I called about the meeting, I said, no, but then they said, it's David Yazbek. And I said, well, I have to at least meet with David Yazbek. I like <laughs> worshipped him. Because you didn't know beforehand it was David Yazbek. Uh, I wouldn't. No, I didn't know. They just said I got a call saying we, they'd like you to. Me. Well, and I'll tell you what the true. I'll tell you the true story. I, you could edit this if it's too long. Yeah, but I, uh, Scott Sanders, who is our producer, right. and Carol Feinerman. Um, Scott Sanders. I had done a musical called Moonshine, which was based on the TV show Hee Haw, mm -hmm. and we did a reading of it that was very successful. The producer Scott Sanders came and saw it and called me into his office. He had the rights to the Sony catalog. Oh. including Tootsie at the time. And he said, go through this catalog, and what do you want to do? I want to work with you. And I picked a movie, a different movie. It was um, uh, a Judy Holiday movie called It Should Happen to You. And we started developing it, and I had come to New York for a week mm -hmm. to work with, it was Shaman and Whitman, Jerry Mitchell, and myself. We were developing wow. this. I, I know, it's a dream <laughs> team. And while I was here, they called about the Tootsie meeting, and I said, I, I didn't want to take the meeting. And my agent called back and said, Mr. Sanders said, you are here on my dime. You are taking the meeting, which I thought, good for him. So, and then I, and they said it was Yazbek, and I said, in a second. And so I went in and, and met with David, and I, and I, I actually kind had of- Had you seen the band's visit? Uh, the band's visit hadn't even opened yet. Okay. This was way, oh, wow, be way wow, before wow. that, okay. yeah, yeah. And, um, and- So what did you know about him? I knew Full Monty. Dirty okay. Rotten Scoundrels was one of my favorite soundtracks of, like, in my top oh, ten my of all favorite. musicals. I love that place. I thought. <laughs> oh, it's, I, I yeah, loved it. Too, um, uh, Woman on the Verge. I had seen all, all his work. Okay. And um, so I had figured I was kind of going to sabotage the meeting by coming up with all these out-of-the-box ideas and say, I don't want to put the movie on stage. One of them was, is we have to take it out of the world of soap opera. To, and ironically, David had already come up with that. So we sort of, it was a kismet oh, wow. of, um, of some of the ideas. Excuse me. Some of the ideas so that, that I came up with, like I was like, "Wow, we're on the same page yeah. on about a lot of these things." Um, I don't want to give away some of them because there are surprises in the show. Okay. But um, 
I had, so we sort of, there were like two or three ideas that I thought were going to be controversial, and he was on the exact same page already. And so wow. it, um, it, uh, it kind of was so that kind of kicked it into kind of kicked it in, and I knew, year, and yeah. I knew people were getting along because I got to talk to you people. I saw how well you just kind we of just, bounced off each other. Patrick, we <laughs> love each other. It is really a. It was what and and you know you said you said you know I, you didn't know who I was forty eight hours ago as many people didn't. But well, I've been I mean, doing I mean, this all, yeah. for Tootsie, but I didn't. Well, I mean, I didn't know you. Were, I first of all I knew thought of you as a Californian because you I'm, would come. I'm from really California. not. But and yeah. Then the other thing <laughs> yeah. Is, and then I looked. I said, oh, he went to NYU. Yeah. And he he went to circle in the square. Yeah. I had a dream of going to NYU, but I had no money. I was on my own at a young age, and I just sort of was really poor. And I was like, I, I would love to study theater, but I, um, and I just had this fantasy of going to NYU. And I found out about a scholarship that um, they gave to one boy and one girl every year. We would, they had a, a full scholarship. And I auditioned. And I wrote my own monologues. I wrote two monologues and auditioned my own monologues. And I got the scholarship. So you were an actor originally? Yes, but I was horrible. But I did not, I do not, I am convinced to this day that I got it because of the monologues and not because of my ability. Uh -huh. Because I was I terrible. I was terrible. I don't, I'm, you know, so honestly. Did, did, why why do you want to act even then? Um, you know, I, I think every everybody who's not an actor in this business started off as an actor. Oh, and okay. then I think, because I, I think that's sort of the allure at first. I, I, I knew I loved writing, and I was sort of supporting myself doing some writing. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. would write monologues for actors for 20 bucks a pop for acting class and auditions and stuff. I advertised in, there was a magazine called uh, uh, oh, Drama Log or Backstage <laughs> or something. <laughs> backstage. And, backstage. Backstage, yeah. And, and, I would, mm -hmm. and I put a little ad in Backstage, and I would write, I would meet with the actor or actress or, or partners, and I would say what, you know, and I would get to know them, and I would write them original monologues. And what would you charge them, how much? 20 bucks, <laughs> 20 bucks, which at that time you know, was a fortune. Ahead, you, you got to Circle in the Square after so I, that. And so what did you do with Circle in the Square, uh, right? Again? I studied well that? it was not a it was not a serendipitous relationship oh, at okay. circle because um, I you know it was Nico Sakharopoulos and Michael Kahn oh, okay. and Terry Hayden and these icons of of theater and they want you to do their way it's yeah, they want you to do. You know, process, all, they want you to do Shakespeare, that. and they want so, you to do the. Yeah, I, they, I, you got you got to Cali California right away, and you 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 produced and created mm. designing. No, I didn't. No, not at all. You no, didn't? I didn't produce. I pr I wrote they, and produced the, it. Wikipedia, I didn't. They say you they credit you. Yeah, well, it's wrong. Oh, I yeah, I was a producer, but I didn't create it. Linda Bloodworth Thomason created it. Okay. I came in in the later years of designing okay. women, and so um, I got to. But they give you. Uh, producing credit. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, they, I'm sorry. In television. But go back. I didn't mean to. Yeah. Go. Okay. No. No. Um, to you where? Got to when I oh. interrupted. Oh uh, no, that's okay. Uh, uh, so I I went to Circle. I didn't last my whole tenure there because I just wanted to. So I again I would just come in with scenes that I wrote for myself and I liked big broad comedy and that was not what they that was not sort of there. <laughs> so no, I said does. this is not going to work and I and I left. I felt that that. Scholarship and that place should be taken by somebody that I think benefited more than I did. And I bummed around New York for a while, and then my mom and sister had gone out to California, and it was a horrible time to be in New York. It was the mid '80s, and the AIDS crisis had hit, and New York was in a depression, and nobody could get a job. It was I needed to get out. I needed to get out, and so I went to California, and just sort of bummed around and got a waiter's job and f trying to figure out what to do, but always writing. And then, um, and what were you writing in the background? Writing plays or writing? I was writing. Well, I was writing, writing at that time pilots, pilots, television. Pilots. I was trying to. So how did how did you hook up to write television pilots? Well, what happened was, um, and I've told this story and it's true, is that my best friend from New York had a boyfriend who was doing Le Cage Faux on tour in L.A., and I <laughs> and he became my roommate. And so he, he eventually moved out to uh, California, was on the beach, met a group of friends. They were looking for a joint. And my friend said, oh, I know we'll have a joint, Robert Horn. And so they came to my house, and I started talking to one of his friends who was working. His name is Danny Margosis, a wonderful writer, who was working um, at CBS as an assistant. And we started talking, and he said, I'm trying to be a writer. And I said, I am too. And we wrote a pilot together. And when you work at that pilot, it was called Cellavision. It was a behind the scenes of a game show. It was a very traditional multicam mm -hmm. sitcom mm -hmm. pilot. This was the uh, this was the eighties and so uh, late eighties and so we wrote this pilot. He gave it to one of the executives at CBS, who Joe, a great gentleman named Joe Voci, who's no longer with us, and um, he said, "This is good. I'm going to give. I'm going to show it to a friend of mine who's an agent at ICM, 
Oh, wow. That agent's name was Scott Schwartz, and the agent said, I like this. I'm going to represent you guys. And literally, two months later, we had our first job. And then we did a series of, like, did, 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 what was the first thing The first that, job what, what, was a TV show by the... Uh, uh, wow, you were, I gotta remember. It was a t it was a TV show by the guy who created Barney Miller called um, Stat uh, about an emergency room, I believe. And we were hired to write one episode. And that was a comedy. It was a comedy. It was a, a, a like Barney Miller s comedy. And then I did a sh I worked on a show called Five Up Two Down, which was a remake of like the Mothers in Law with Diane Carroll and Cleavon Little. And just all these shows that kind of didn't and go anywhere. What happened is we got a call one day about um, they were looking for joke writers, for staff writers on Designing Women. And we went in and, and got that part. And then a whole, through a series of events, within a matter of like five or six months, we elevated up and became basically the showrunners of it. Yeah. So I got to write the very final episode of Designing Women, which was a two-part episode, oh, wow. which was a Gone with the Wind sort of um, spoof. And so, yeah. So we did. I did that. And then, yeah, well, you can you can... Well, then you really kicked into high gear, it, kinda, it seems like. I mean, yeah. you have you developed series for Fox and CBS. Yeah. And you worked with so many people and developed series for Jennifer Holiday. I mean, the, the names Jennifer Hudson. On. Jennifer Hudson. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer yeah, no, Hudson. that's okay. <laughs> Went on and on. Uh, you worked with RuPaul, did stuff for yes, Bette Midler. Yes, yes. You, you came back and forth to New York. Yeah. You just I always oh, wanted Dame to do theater. Oh, Dame Edna. Oh, Dame Edna. Dame Edna. Oh, my God. That was such a, well, you know. I, it, it, I think there are no accidents, I think. I, I mean, believe the, the same yeah, thing. I mean, granted, I live in L.A. on the 405. There are plenty of accidents. <laughs> but um, go see Tootsie. This man but, is, but, never but, stops. But, you know, uh, when I was in L.A., I had done, uh, I had a show on the air, a very short-lived show called High Society, which was sort of an American version of Ab Fab. Absolutely fabulous. Okay, I With, love Ab Fab. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that you would love. It only lasted one season. It was a little ahead of its time. What is this, by the way? It was called High Society. It was a uh, Gene Smart, who I had met from Designing mm -hmm. Women, I love her um, Mary McDonald from Dances with Wolves and, and you know, Academy Award, and Faith Prince. And it was sort of a, 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 a my version of, of AppFab. I had gone to London and seen AppFab and I said, I love this. So I wanted to write a show about two sort of best friends who they are very eccentric and over the top. And, and so, but I, after that show ended, I got an overall production deal at Warner Brothers. And I got a call from the head of Warner Brothers asking me if I would take a meeting with the legendary Bob Boyette, who at the time was Miller Boyette. So, you know, I don't know if Miller Boyette, Full House, Family Matters, T TGI, they coined TGIF. Got it. And Mr. Boyette and I did a pilot together and became very, very good what friends. What was that pilot? Do you remember? Yes, it was called, I don't, uh, it was called. Uh, what was it about? It was a. It was a pilot about just the friendship of these two girls. It was um, Christine Taylor, who went off and then married Ben Stiller, but I think they were all married. And um, uh, I forgot. God, it was a long time ago. Um, it's okay. And, so. and, and it was fun, but it didn't get on the air. It never, got, it never made yeah, it on. You but, if it but, yeah, you would remember. <laughs> but Bob and I became very, very close friends. And all we did was talk about theater. And when he left, and he's, he's a very loyal man. And when he left uh, L.A. and came to New York and became the Empresario, producer that he is, ten Tony Awards. He made that deal to bring all the plays over from the National. He developed dozens and dozens of, of musicals. He called me and he remembered me and knew I wanted to do theater and gave me my first break. And it was Day Medna. He said, "We've got this show, Day Medna. Um, we want to bring somebody in to work with Barry Humphreys and just sort of have fun." And he said, "I think you'd be the guy." And he did, and that gave me my first job. Well, it was also a perfect match. It was great. He, the man is a genius. He's a genius. And it's very interesting, too, because he is so um, both protective and possessive of, because he has many characters that he's done. For, in America, we know Dame Edna, but in Australia, he's known for many, many characters, uh, sort of like what Carol Burnett would be. Mm -hmm. And so it was very interesting. When he's Barry Humphreys, he will never talk as Dame Edna. He, you have to be day med. He will talk about her, but he won't. He would well, not. I start, because yeah. you're only giving an affectation. Cool. You're not really sinking into the full exactly. embodiment of what it's all about. Yeah. Um, but it was an incredible. Had to cut your teeth on that as your first like real gig. It was, it was um, I, uh, that ended, and I got a call again from Bob Boyette saying there's a show. It was called Lone Star Love. I don't know if you remember that whole Randy Quaid crazy drama stuff. It was that show, um, and then I went and we did that show, but it. 
you could Google Randy Quaid Lone Star Love It, you'll see it was a whole crazy thing. But th that, and then he called and um, said, I'm, there's a musical in LA, I want you to come and see it, and I did. Uh, and he said, we're going to bring it to New York, but we're looking to bring another writer in to sort of do a, uh, another a diff uh, uh, work on it. And that was 13. When we were talking, one of the times you said then Santino got attached to the project really yeah. early and it inspired you. So having someone like that, knowing what they do, does that, you get this, you get, you get them so you have you're inspired to write the truly, for them. Yes, you, you, you write with them. With them, yes. And, and for them, yes. Uh, uh, you know, Obviously, the ca there was a character that existed in the movie, and you know that's sort of your your, 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 uh, your where you start from, yeah. yes. But then you get Scott Ellis to come in, and not only that, but then he says, "I'm only going to do this if Santino Fatano is my leading man." And David and I were like, "Okay, I actually I knew I had seen him in Cinderella. I didn't know him all that well." Right, right. Um, and he came in, and we did a table read, and after that table read, I was like, "Holy!" Crap! It was amazing. It was. It was just. I think. And what, what do you pull out of that? What, what do you pull out of something like that? that you oh. hone into to write a, to write for or with. What, what was? Yes. What is it you see? That well, you can I take away. A lot. No, that's a. That's a whole other episode. But I. <laughs> okay. But I will. But I will tell <laughs> you uh, briefly. <laughs> I. I hear rhythms. How people. How somebody. I can sit down. I can work with an actor and very instantly know what they're good at. I know where. Where they, their rhythm, how they'll speak, what they bring to it, their, the analytical approach they take to a character, I can see that right away. I just can hear it. It's sort of a, it's so almost hear, like if I was a pianist and somebody played the piano, you'd be able to know if they were playing in tune or not. I wouldn't, but if I was a musician, I would. So when you say you can hear it, do you have to see them doing it too? Or yeah. Do you have, is it just a, so it's I, a combination? It's a combination. It's just, be, and I, I could tell uh, when he was reading my jokes, but the humor. I could tell what he liked and what he didn't like. Oh. I could tell what he, I, I could tell what he connected to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I could then I started to see the the t what was very important to him a, as to myself and and David and Scott was that Dorothy Michaels, the persona that he then creates, right. is never it's not it's not drag. It's not that it is actually that he is a that the character of Michael Dorsey is a consummate actor. Who creates a character that he is going to play, and that he believes it, and the people around him on that stage must believe it. And I started to watch how his—it's really fascinating when you watch him. His literally every every part of his body changes when he becomes Dorothy Michaels. His not just his mannerisms, but every affectation, every every muscle in his body. I don't know how he does it. So as I started to see that, even sitting behind a table, I, and then he, as he started to play with the voice, and he started to play with. You know, I, I started to see that not only can he deliver comedy really well, but he's a great reactor. So I knew, okay, if I can surround him with Which means he's a good listener. He's a great he's a great listener. And mm -hmm. he's also not to jump to change the subject, but he's also a leader. Uh, uh, this is a real as I like to say, a, a clown car of comedians on that stage. But he definitely is the the leader and he definitely has taken that role. And you can feel it on the stage too. He is pulling that show, he's leading that show. He's in every scene except one. And um, yeah, and so it was just like, it was great. I mean, we he had a lot of opinions, All he's very smart. He would see things I just wouldn't see. He could see where he knew he, um, it was uh, uh, too soon to make a transition to emotionally, oh. to becoming, to, to becoming a woman. He, it was very important for him to understand the female perspective if he was going to play that role and didn't want to do it unless he could understand that. Um, he would, uh, I will give you one instance, there was, this is a little off subject, but there was a joke and I was convinced there was a word and a joke that I was convinced was the right word and he was convinced it was the wrong word. And in a joke, one word will change the entire meaning of a joke. And I, and I said, all right, you do it your way one night, I'll do it my way the next, don't tank my way because you want your way to win. And he did it and he was right, he was right. And that one word got the joke a laugh that it didn't have before. Scott Ellis also played a big part in that. Uh, Santino and Scott had had a relationship before this, they had done something together. And that's how Scott knew him and they worked really closely together in really shaping this character in um, you know in 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 helping to create an arc for both 
Michael Dorsey and Dorothy Michaels, and of course, how to approach the, you know, it was important to, to Santino, I had gone in with the idea that I sort of believe you don't, a character doesn't have to be likable for you to like them. And that the, the whole, and Michael Dorsey does not start out as a necessarily likable person. He's, uh, he's, he's right a lot of the times when you see him at the beginning mm -hmm. of the show. He's, his approach to his opinions are not the best, you know, right. there, but, but he's right about what he, right. you know, he, and, and he, he's, a, he's a true artist. He just doesn't have a lot of self-awareness about how, how he to present, how to present it. <laughs> and he's a bit of a, he's a bit of a narcissist. And um, so, so it was um, really important that, that uh, I, I felt that I don't want to, I don't want to dumb, dumb it down. I don't want to like, feel like, well, you have to like him or the audience is, I was, I said, no, you, you have to like him. You have to like not liking him enough to take the journey and know that he will have remorse at the end and you will love him, that he will learn his lesson and he will find something he did not have at the beginning. And that was very important to Santino also, that the character had a real journey and a real arc. And in then developing that and creating Dorothy Michaels, so did she. And so, and so uh, it was just really just, a, it was a, I, I say, I don't think anything will ever be this good. <laughs> Scott Ellis. It's a true maestro of casting. He's, his instincts are incredible, and we worked with Jim Carnahan, who is our, our casting director. In television and film, your job is to make sure everything is on that page, and that the scene has all the, the, the context and subtext and story drive and narrative that it needs. In a musical, especially when you write the book to a musical, the music has to deliver that. So you have to work against the instincts that you've been trained for when you work in those other art forms and make sure you're not redundant to what the music is supposed to do in a musical. So my job is to kind of get you there wow. as, as entertainingly and as, in my case, comedically as possible, but not do the job of the songs. And, and I love that, that puzzle. So it's different in that respect. And in LA, when you're working on a TV show, you have a writer's room, so it is collaborative. Um, but, but the writers are sort of um, working to create your vision as the creator or showrunner of the show, whereas in theater, everybody, there's a, everybody's doing a sort of a different job, and the job of a director is to unify that with their vision uh, and bring it all together. So uh, theater is, I feel like, a bit of more collaborative in, in that way, that not everybody's doing the same thing, but working for the same cause. Three and a half years on this show, never, never a fight, never, a, it was, laughing we we joke that the note sessions with Scott are oh, wow. funnier than the show <laughs> it was it was Scott is is a I actually believe he's a little underrated in that he's got this incredible body of work but Scott doesn't come into a show saying this is going to be a Scott Ellis show Scott comes into a show and says what does this show ask of me what do I need to bring to this piece this individual piece and then he he lets everybody do their job and then he just basically creates a symphony from it. He brings it all together. And you don't know how he did it. All you know is that you want to deliver for him. You want to bring your A game because you just want to please him. And then before you, you look at the stage and there's the show and you don't know how he did it. It's, it's, I know it takes great effort, but he makes it look effortless. Well, he was in the rink. He was an actor. He was an actor dancer. He was no, he started opposite. He was Liza opposite Liza Minnelli, Minnelli in the ring. <laughs> he has some funny stories about that. Wonderful stories. Scott knows everybody. It's crazy, um, but he um, loves what he does so much, and he loves actors, and he's able to have this communication with actors that I think some directors don't have because they didn't have that experience of being an actor, and he knows how to communicate with actors. Let he create he creates an environment where they're not afraid to try. Which well, is I mean, fantastic. That, that's the biggest thing you need to do. But also, too, I think it's really, I personally feel like a, a, someone that's acted before and then directs really knows what actors need, and like you said, and gives them the opportunity to try whatever it is they need. That they have yeah. a, and it's And you, it, you, it's just knowing exactly how to communicate to an actor what it is you want without feeling that you're telling them what to do. And that you're, it's, again, it's that collaboration. Actor, director, uh, book writer, director, book writer, composer, book writer, actor, composer, director. It's all these elements that play. And when you have a good team, it's a joy. But, you know, a lot of times when shows don't work, it's because they did not find that, um, that the, the, the creative team didn't find the right connection, which happens. You, you're thrown together with people you kind of don't know.
Right. It's it's instant marriage. It's like what one of those reality shows where it's like, you know, hey, you're getting married today. See if you can I mean, live together. I mean, who knows you're going to get along with David like you got? I mean, what makes that no happen? No idea. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just, it's chemistry. It's the, Who knows how that happens? Exactly well, right. You know, let's go, go back just a little bit. Sure. When did you first realize you were funny or know you were funny, and how did you begin to cultivate it? Oh, wow, Once that's you, a good question. Uh, I was always, I always... Uh, like since a young kid, you oh, since you, very you, young you kid, make, I everybody laugh. I always wanted to make people laugh. I always was about how how can I get a laugh. What was it? What was it about making people I laugh? I just I don't know. Maybe it was just feel that feeling of being accepted. Oh. I, have, I actually have a TV thing that I'm doing, a TV project, and I have um, sort of two musical. Well, I don't want to say it because. I'm kind of getting offered things now that I may yeah, do. But I, I did a, this musical a few years ago called Moonshine, um, which we're going to now come bring back again and, and do re, uh, re look at and do. And then I'm doing um, the Tammy Faye Baker musical with uh, Henry Krieger and David Yazbek and Kristen Chenoweth and Bobby Longbottom. Kristen Chenoweth is a Tammy Faye Baker. Oh, Tammy Faye Baker. Yeah, and she's going to play Tammy Faye? She is. Wow. Yeah. Oh, and then, now, have you worked with her before? I have not. So, have you? Did you meet her yet? Oh my God, yes. Oh, she's. I love everything her. I you love want her. her to be. She is, and more. Because I know, I know. She's. Just, I, oh, she's was it going to be pleasure writing for her too? Were oh you, my God, got her she, We're already. To, I mean, she's very. She feels she is very. Um, uh, connected to the life of Tammy Faye Baker, who played a very important part of her faith growing up and her life. And she's really connected to this to this woman and has very strong uh, ideas and, and thoughts. It's fantastic. It's so, um, it's resonating already and it's so, but it's, every time we talk it like bubbles up and uh, she's, it's very, it's Kristen Chenoweth. I mean, it's Kristen Chenoweth. I mean, yeah, pretty great. Got her, on, got, it, well, got her on my phone. That's all well, I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, we actually, basically, uh, uh, we've been doing a lot of the work ahead of time, but you know, we had to take. A, I had to stop to do Tootsie and, and all this. But basically, next week we dive right back into that. So um, hopefully, uh, uh, we'll have some. We'll. It'll be soon. Well, when you see Kristen again, remind her I, I suggested she needs an organic mattress. <laughs> oh, I'm going to tell we'll her tell that. You about okay. Congratulations. Thank Robert. you, Patrick. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, thank you. For